Hello everyone. <laughs> Hope you're all doing well. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Welcome to our church family, our worship service. Today is March, March thir 13. 13. Sunday. <laughs> it's uh, St. Patrick's uh, Day week. So happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. <clears throat> and also today is uh, the daylight savings time or the start of this daylight saving time. And um, we, we have to recover one hour lost uh, yeah. tonight, uh, sleep early. <laughs> um <clears throat> so t next week we will have our in-person meeting so hope to see you uh next week and uh, <clears throat> hopefully we'll see uh, dorothy and joyce this time mm, yeah <clears throat> so we look forward to that and um <clears throat> other updates um as usual and to beatrice still the same and um, the war in Ukraine, it's still in our mm. hearts and minds. And uh, it looks like uh, COVID is uh, going, down. going down and not uh, uh, going uh, serious anymore. So we're thankful for that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so... <clears throat> Um, this uh, oh, today we'll have Dan Rogers uh, sermon again he gave a sermon on Luke 13 and uh, okay. let's open in prayer <clears throat> dear God our father we come before you again uh, today to uh, worship you and to just get together um, through this video and we thank you once again for uh, calling us together to know you and to have a relationship with you at this time of our lives. We know, Lord, that you love the whole world, that you gave your Son uh, to redeem all peoples to yourself and to reconcile everyone, not counting anyone's sins against us, against them. So we thank you, Father, that uh, <clears throat> we can trust in that love and that's... Uh, the guiding light uh, in our lives now, even in these uh, troubled times that we have uh, uh, wars and rumors of war uh, in this world. So we trust that your love will prevail and your kingdom come and your will be done. So we thank you, Lord, for uh, <clears throat> getting us through these two years, these two years of pandemic and we Pray, Lord, for um, your blessings upon those who are uh, afflicted and affected by uh, this COVID. And as we pray also for uh, those who are uh, affected by the war in Ukraine, and those who are displaced and are, are um, hurt and lost loved ones. We pray for your uh, peace to prevail in that uh, area of the world. So we uh, thank you once again for our brothers and sisters in the church and uh, pray for those who are sick among us. Um, just want to mention Barbara Rogers for she's uh, not getting better, but uh, still in severe pain. So we pray for your intervention, Lord, and your mercy upon her and also for Dan Rogers and the family. We pray for those who are sick also uh, among us and uh, <clears throat> our senior members who are um, getting up in age, especially Oma, who will be 99 years old next week. So we pray for your blessing upon them all. So we thank you once again for this service, Lord, and we uh, submit our, our lives to your hands now, and we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For our worship, songs <laughs> okay for worship songs we'll have all because of jesus and above all and before that i'd like to read 
Psalms chapter 27 verses 1 through 4. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek, to seek Him in His temple. Amen. Amen. It sounds like a very appropriate uh, scripture for our time. So, happy worship. See you next week.
study published in the Journal of Business Ethics in 2000 found that promise keeping was not a high priority in the American workplace. In fact, only 30% of the 700 study participants kept their word in business, and if they were faced with legal action, even then, only 57% would keep their word. News like this can be discouraging, but let me share the story of one CEO who kept his promise to his employees. Josh James, the co-founder and former CEO of the web analytics company Omniture, was faced with a tough choice in December of 2000 when he had to lay off 48 employees without severance to save the company. James told the laid off employees that if he ever found a way to pay them the severance that they should have had, he would do it. Almost five years later, James was able to send those employees the severance money they were due. He demonstrated integrity in business, and as a result, some of those former employees came back to work for him when he started another company. Integrity matters. Our God is a God of integrity, though admittedly, we don't always act like we believe it. A good example is Abraham, who later was renamed Abraham. He struggled to believe God's promise to provide Abraham with descendants. Note his conversation with God in Genesis 15. Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abraham in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abraham, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abraham replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. Notice that Abraham is already trying to take control of the problem and come up with a solution. He's doubting that God is going to keep his promise. Does God get angry with Abraham when he doubts? Let's see what happened next. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. God reminds Abraham of the original promise made. He doesn't give Abraham a list of things to do to help the process along. In fact, God shows Abraham through a sacred ritual that the promise coming true would have nothing to do with Abraham's efforts at all. God's promise was a covenant he made that depends on God alone, proving his integrity. And later, Abraham had a son with his wife, Sarah. God's word is true. The example of Josh James keeping his promise to his laid off employees, even though he wasn't legally obligated, illustrates the integrity of character we find in the story of Abraham's interaction and covenant with God. We can count on God to patiently remind us of his promises when we get discouraged and start thinking we need to do something to make those promises happen. May you rest in the knowledge that the Father, Son, and Spirit will always keep their promises. I'm Michelle Fleming, speaking of life. But we have now entered the 40-day uh, season, that is a period of preparation for Easter. And in the Gospel of Luke, the life and public ministry of Jesus takes place in Galilee. So for a long period of time, perhaps three years, Jesus preached and taught in Galilee. And for Luke, then finally after that, the end of Jesus' public ministry, he, as it says in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus sets his face for Jerusalem. And that means that he is now on his journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, and the cross awaits him there. So this is the journey period in the Gospel of Luke that we're going to be taking a look at today. 
Our pericope is set in the context of that journey to Jerusalem. We're going to look at Luke chapter 13, verses 31 through 35, and see what we can understand about Jesus' words and actions as he approaches Jerusalem and how those words and actions apply to us who are followers of Jesus today. So let's look at Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 31. It begins at that time, that is, on the journey to Jerusalem, some Pharisees came to Jesus. Now you may remember that the Pharisees are generally in the Gospels the opponents of Jesus. Now there are some exceptions. You can't paint all Pharisees with one broad stroke. Uh, They're individuals. and some actually became followers of Jesus, but as a whole, as a party, as a group, in the Gospel of Luke, as in the other Gospels, the Pharisees are opposed to Jesus. So the Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Now you might think, well, that was nice of them to warn Jesus. Uh Aha, I don't think so. I think it was a trick. Because in Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 53, the Pharisees plotted how to trick and how to trap Jesus. And so if you read the Gospel of Luke carefully and you take Luke for what he's trying to say to his readers, I think you have to read that the Pharisees here are trying to trick and trap Jesus and get him to shut up and go into hiding or at least get out of Galilee where perhaps uh, they have more control and can get him in trouble, which is exactly what's going to happen. So I read Luke here to say that the Pharisees are bad folks and that they're trying to trick and plot, perhaps even with Herod, to get Jesus in trouble. So leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. That's not true, according to Luke. That's a lie. And some say, well, Herod, uh, Herod killed John the Baptist. Yeah, he didn't want to. You remember the story? He got tricked into it. And in front of all his guests, he was embarrassed and didn't want to look bad. And so he had John executed, but that's not what Herod Antipas wanted to do to John the Baptist, and he did not want to kill Jesus. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, we're told that Herod wanted to see Jesus do some miracles. He was kind of interested in him. And Herod was already being sort of, if you will, haunted by the ghost of John the Baptist. And then when some people said, well, we think that this Jesus is maybe John the Baptist resurrected, Herod was like, oh, no. Here we go again, but he did not want to kill him. So I read Luke to say that this is a lie and a trick. Now, Jesus sees right through it. Notice what Jesus responds. Verse 32, he replied, go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people. They were, no, I'm not going into hiding. You can't trick and fool me. I'm going to keep doing my ministry until the day I die. And I'm on a journey to Jerusalem, and no one's going to stop me or trick me or hinder me or cause me to give up or stop. I'm not afraid of Herod or of you Pharisees. Now, it's interesting here that Jesus replies, go tell that fox. So he calls Herod a fox. Now, what does he mean by that? Allopax is is the Greek word. It's feminine. Now, the translators struggle with this because, you know, metaphors in different languages mean different things. Now, do you know what in English we call a female fox? A vixen. Now, doesn't that bring some connotations to mind? Oh, Herod was a vixen? Yeah, but he's, Jesus was not speaking English. <laughs> that's, that's not what he meant. And some people say, well, he's calling him foxy. 
Well, again, that's, that's English. You're not getting at the metaphor there. Say, well, he was cunning and, and clever and fox. No, that's not right either. Now, anybody know what the Spanish word for fox is? You've heard of him? He makes the sign of the Z. Zorro. <laughs> Zorro is the Spanish word for fox. Now, the feminine form in Spanish is Zora, la Zora. You think, oh, well, that's a female. No, in many Spanish cultures, it's a slang term for a slut. So you got to know the language. You can't just say he calls him a fox, a female fox at that. What does he mean? All right, I'm here to tell you. Jesus probably spoke this in Aramaic. Luke puts it into Greek. But we don't need to look at the Greek metaphor exactly. We really need to get at the Aramaic metaphor that Jesus used when he called him a female fox. What he meant was that in Hebrew tradition, lions were kings. If you were a king, you were a lion, a male lion. But, and if you weren't a lion, if you were a pretender, if you were insignificant, you were a fox. And really insignificant, you were a female fox. Now, we might call the, uh, I was looking for a good English synonym here. They call him, he's a small fry. That's what he is. Am I worried about Herod? Jesus is saying, I'm not worried about Herod. I'm not worried about that small fry. He's insignificant. Now, the story behind that is when Herod took over the territory of Galilee and, the, and Perea and the Transjordan, uh, he was hoping that the emperor in Rome would make him king. And the emperor goes, no, you're a tetrarch. But I want to be a king. No, you're a tetrarch. Go away. And so Jesus is almost picking up on that and saying, he's no lion. He's a female fox. He's insignificant. Small potatoes, small fry. I'm not worried about him. So go tell that fox. I'll keep, oh, oh another thing. Notice that Jesus does not hesitate to criticize political leaders. So it is okay. <laughs> Just thought you might want to know that. Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today, tomorrow, and on the third day. All right. What does that mean? That's Jesus' ministry. He's going to continue his ministry. He drove out demons to show that the kingdom of God has come and the God of this world, the devil, can't hold on to it any longer. The kingdom of God is replacing him. And I show that by casting out demons, showing that I have power. That's who I am. I am Jesus, the Son of God, and the demons obey me. And the kingdom of God has come upon you. And I'm healing the sick. And of course, as you probably know, the Greek term, uh, used for healing mostly is the same word used for saving. I'm healing, I'm saving people. The healings Jesus did were signs, again, that he had come to restore, to heal, to forgive, to save people. So he's saying, my ministry continues. I'm still at work. And then he says, today, tomorrow, and on the third day, and some have seen in that a reference to the resurrection, maybe it is, but the expression here more or less means continuously. I'm just, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to heal people today, tomorrow, and on the third day, day by day, every day. I'm going to continue my ministry until I reach my goal. And the word goal there could be translated, I think, better, end. Till I reach my end. Till I reach the finish. 
I'm going to keep up the ministry until they nail me to the cross. And no one is going to hinder me. No one's going to stop me. And no one's going to scare me, especially not that small fry Herod. Verse 33. In any case, I must press on today, tomorrow, and the next day. Now, the Greek word translated must, day, D-E-I, it's the way we would transliterate it in English. Luke uses it over and over and over again in his gospel to talk about the plan of God. I must. And when he says must, it, it, it conveys more than just our English word. It means everything that God has asked me to do, the whole plan of salvation, I must carry out the mission. I must carry out the plan, the mission from the Father through the Son done in the Spirit. So in any case, I must press on, keep going today, tomorrow, and the next day, day by day, every day, continuously. For surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Now what we see here is how did Jesus identify himself. Who is Jesus? For Jesus, he is the prophet, the one like unto Moses who was to come in the last days, the one greater than Moses, the prophet. For Jesus and for Luke, he is the prophet. No prophet can die outside Jerusalem. And, and what that probably means is, is without Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the headquarters of the Jewish religion at the time. The Jewish religious leaders, the Sanhedrin was located there, and also government officials such as Pilate from Rome. And Jerusalem was, we might call it, the headquarters city. In fact, in Deuteronomy, it's called the city of God. It's where God placed his name. And so it's ironic that he says nothing can a prophet can't die without, apart from Jerusalem. And then he goes on to talk about the history. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now he switches here to a lament, a cry of grief, because he's thinking about, he's just said a prophet can't die apart from or without Jerusalem. Jerusalem has to authorize it. Jerusalem's going to do it. That's where I'm going to be tried that's where they're going to bring false charges against me. That's where I'm going to be sentenced to death. It's going to happen in Jerusalem, of all places, the city of God. And then I think he becomes emotional. And he laments and he cries out, Jerusalem, J Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. Oh, the irony of it all, that God chose you, Jerusalem, to be his city on earth. And how have you reacted? You've rebelled against him. And every time God sent you a prophet trying to set you straight and bring you back to him, you killed them. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I have longed to gather you, to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Now, one of the things that's interesting here is the use of the Greek word thelo for want. Notice, if, if you were paying attention back when we read, Herod wants to kill you. Herod wants. Jesus wants. What does he want? I want to gather you under my wings and protect you. But what do you want? You don't want me. Want, want, want. How often I have longed, I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Now here, Jesus uses female imagery. It's interesting, he used female imagery for Herod. And now he uses female imagery for himself. And it's also, we note, it's the fox in the hen house. Kind of an interesting play on those metaphors as well. 
But Jesus says he's like a mother. You know, sometimes people say, well, uh, let's call God her or she. I'm not offended by that, and I don't think God is. Because guess what? God is not male, and God is not female. We see him as a father because of the role that he plays is a fatherly role. But is he literally a father? No. But there are other roles that God plays too, and some of them are female. And here Jesus says, I am like a mother hen. That's what I'm like. I'm like a mother hen. And a mother hen's nature is to protect her chicks. To gather them under her wings. Even if there's a fire in the hen house, a mother hen will gather her chicks and die. Give her life for her chicks. And is that not what Jesus is going to do? Like a mother hen, I love you. You know, we talk about to love someone as only a mother can. Well, that's nothing compared to the love that God has for us. Like a mother hen, he wants to gather his chicks, you and me, everyone, under her wings to protect us, to save us, to keep us from harm. So he's crying out, oh, Jerusalem, uh, I, I, how can you betray God, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the prophets God sent and betray me. When you're God's city, how can you betray God so? And all I want to do is love you and care for you and protect you. That's what I want, but you don't want me. Oh, the pain that Jesus felt. It hurt, and so he cries out. So you're not willing, but verse 35, look, your house is left to you desolate. What does he mean by that? Well, some have seen a reference to the temple, and the temple is going to be left desolate in 70 AD. The Romans are gonna destroy it and destroy the city of Jerusalem. Or it could be the oikos, the household, the whole thing of Jerusalem, you know, by about, what was it, 135 A.D., Jerusalem was left desolate. There was not a Jewish person left in the city. It was completely controlled by Gentiles, and all the, almost the Jewish folk had had to flee. The city, your city's going to be desolate, because you don't want me. Look, your house is left to you desolate, a waste. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a chant from Psalm 118, verse 26. That was chanted by the pilgrims at the Passover season. And so probably if pilgrims were on their way to the city to celebrate Passover, uh, which Jesus was doing as well. And remember, there were crowds of thousands of people going all to Jerusalem for the festival. And if you can imagine them all chanting, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, in the name, in the power, in the authority, representing God. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So he's saying to the crowds before him, and particularly to the Pharisees, you won't see me again until I show up at the triumphal entry. And when I show up, not riding on a stallion, a charger, <laughs> but riding on a donkey. <laughs> then people will shout, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So you're not going to see me until then. But could it also be a foretelling of the future that some will not see him again until the resurrection? Well, we praise God that when they see him in the resurrection, may they call out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and accept him. We hope for that. So what do we learn from all of this? What do we, what do we get here? Well, first of all, we, we see from this passage, who is Jesus? 
For Jesus and Luke, Jesus is a prophet sent by God to proclaim the arrival of the rule, the reign, the kingdom of God, and its availability to all people. He did this through the symbolism of exorcism, casting out demons, and healing, saving, restoring people. We also note that Jesus was fully in charge of his own life and destiny. Herod wasn't going to tell him what to do. Pharisees are not going to tell me what to do. I'm on a mission from God. From the Father to the Son through the Spirit. And nothing is going to stop what I've been sent to do. Yes, I know that means I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be scourged. I'm going to be ridiculed. I'm going to be nailed to a cross and I'm going to die. I know that. But nothing's going to stop me from my destiny. That's my mission, and I'm going to fulfill it. Jesus was fully in charge. Even the prospect of death could not stop him from the mission. As he said, I came to seek and save the lost. Had Adam and Eve in the garden, they hid from God. So who got lost? Adam and Eve. Humanity got themselves lost. Have they ever been lost to God? No. God knows exactly where Adam and Eve were. He knows exactly where all humans are. But in their own hearts and minds, we as humans have become lost. And God seeks us and saves us from our lostness. And nothing's going to stop Jesus from doing that. But are we, as his followers today, are we committed to Jesus' ongoing mission to seek and save the lost? Are we? I mean, look how committed Jesus was to that mission. We participate in that mission today, you and I, as followers of Jesus. We participate in the ongoing mission of Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. Is something deterring us? It's not Herod. It's not the Pharisees. What could it be? Could it be fear? Could it be laziness? Could it be complacency? Not even persecution. <laughs> fear, laziness, complacency. And yet Jesus went to the cross to seek and save the lost. What are you and I doing to be on mission with God. We notice what different ones wanted. We saw what Herod wanted, saw what Jesus wanted, then we saw what the people of Jerusalem didn't want. What do you want? Jesus wanted to gather his people together like a mother hen, protect them, shield them, Save them. But the people do not want Jesus. So what do you want? Do you and I want to reach out and help and save others? Do we want to take people and put them under our wings like a mother hen? And let them know they're loved? That they're cared about? Do we want to save people from evil, from destruction, from sin? Do we? Do we want to share the love of Jesus with those around us? To do that, we've got to let people know how much Jesus loves them and that in him they're forgiven of all their sins. We've got to let people know that. I, one of my first deep realizations of that occurred to me one time when I was, uh, I was taking a trip to a conference or something and uh, it was in the wee hours of the morning, I was at the airport and guess what? My flight was delayed. I thought about, well, I'll just drive back home and sleep for a while and come back, because they said it might not be till afternoon. Then I thought, well, no, that's kind of risky. And then I sat there and I said, well, maybe I'll just sleep right here at the airport. Then I thought, well, if I fall asleep, I may miss my flight and that would be terrible. <gasps> so I'll just stay awake. I hadn't slept much all night. And now I was going to stay awake, and here it was the wee hours of the morning, and the flight wasn't until the afternoon. Let me tell you, when I got on that airplane, there was only one thought in my mind. Go to sleep. 
So I found my seat, and out of habit, I took a book, a theology book, out of my briefcase, and I put it in the little pocket in back of the seat in front of me. Just I wasn't going to read. I, I just habit. I did. And then I just wanted to sleep. Well, I see a young man coming toward me, and pretty sure he's going to sit down next to me. I'm thinking, I hope he doesn't bother me. I want to sleep. So he sits down the seat next to me, and I'm trying to let him know I'm sleeping here. And he looks at my book. And he says, is that a book about God? I'm like, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I don't know much about God. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, the heart to reach out. <laughs> Not an evangelist, to say the least. <laughs> I just want to sleep. So he says, yeah, well, you know, my wife is religious. That's good. Yeah, she goes to church every Sunday. Okay. I don't. I don't care. He said, oh, if I showed up at church, God would have a fit. He'd be so angry because I tell you, I, I don't mind telling you, I've done some things in my life I'm not proud of. I'm just thankful my wife married me. And even if she knew some of the things I'd done, I bet she wouldn't have. But God knows, and boy, God, I'm telling you, he doesn't want me around. He said, but I've got to tell you, there's one thing I do wonder Okay, what's that? I just wonder why God created me and what my purpose in life is. Oh, I'm going to have to talk to this guy. All right, here we go. I said, sir, the first thing you need to know is how much God loves you. And he goes, no, I just explained to you, God's angry with me, man. I've done some things. Boy, he's ticked off. If I ever show up to church, God will have a fit. I said, no, God loves you. He said, well, I wish I could believe that, but I can't. Well, that plane ride lasted four and a half hours. And for at least four of those hours, I told that man that God loved him. And as the wheels of that plane touched the tarmac at our landing destination. That man said, Dan, I don't know how you did it. I didn't do it. I believe God loves me. I believe God's forgiven me of my sins. Yes. And he said, I want to thank you for letting me know what my purpose in life is. And I said to him, I haven't even gotten to that yet. I said, well, well, what's my purpose? I said, your purpose in life is to go tell other people that God loves them. And he said, well, what good's that going to do? I said, what good has it done for you today? And he goes, it's turned my life around. I'm going to start going to church every Sunday with my wife. And I said, that's the effect it can have on people when they know that God loves them. Your purpose when you get up to get off this plane, is to go and tell folks how much God loves them. So I began to see for the first time in my life the power and effect of when the Holy Spirit works in a situation like that to change people's hearts and minds when we participate with what the Spirit is doing and let people know that God, like a mother hen, wants to take them under her wings and shelter them and love them and cares about them. How will you respond? Jerusalem said, we don't want you. Jesus said, someday, <laughs> someday, I think you're gonna change your mind, but you really break my heart today because I love you so very, very much. You and I need to realize that God has taken us under his wings. I should say her wings. And loves us like a mother hen loves her chicks. Only by analogy, infinitely 
infinitely more than we can even imagine. God loves you. God loves me. Well, how about we tell some other folks about that? How about some people who don't know that? Who don't understand God as a mother hen? Who don't understand God as one who gives and one who loves and one who will never give up on anyone? How can we not share that message with others and be on mission with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can say, thank you, God. Blessed are you, God. Praise to you, God. Praise Jesus. But how wonderful is it going to be as we participate in the ongoing ministry of Jesus Christ through the power of Spirit to share God's love with other people. Let them know how much God loves them so that one day in their lives, they too will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what
For our benediction, the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. <music>